Welcome to the D.A.R.E. podcast, where it is all about helping people overcome anxiety and panic attacks. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is free to download at DareResponse.com. Now, without further ado, here is the D.A.R.E. podcast. Hello, everybody. I might have kicked Aida out when I came in. Hello. Oh, first chat up. Hi. Hi, everyone. We have Dr. Sanjay Gupta coming in today. Um, oh, hold on. Just here it comes. Here it comes, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Let me just see. Um, hi. Hi, Dr. Gupta. <laughs> so it's so good to see you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Can you hear and see us? I can. Lovely. Wonderful. We know you're such a busy man, so thank you so much for taking the time to do this. People are so excited. So are we. You're most welcome. Thank you for having me. So we have a lot of happy people on this call. So oh, yes. I'm very happy to see you. <laughs> you really are. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> and well, so Aida, your hair looks very nice. Oh, God. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> I kind of had a hair hair disaster. <laughs> Trust. Looks good. A lot of anxiety. <laughs> joking. Cool. So um, everybody, Dr. Sanjay Gupta is part of our advisory board. Him and Dr. Nishi, um, whom you have met, what was that last week or two weeks ago? Dr. So, Nishi, oh, maybe a month ago, a month or so. Already, so already, already yeah. Okay, so Dr. Sanjay Gupta and Dr. Nishi Bhopal are heads of our advisory board, and Dr. Gupta is here today to talk about everything heart sensations and anxiety. Um, Dr. Gupta, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a great privilege to be here, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, my, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist. I work in the United Kingdom in a small place called York. Um, I deal with all aspects of heart disease, um, and I'm kind of a jack of all trades, so to speak. Um, and I guess everything I am is because a few years ago, I started uh, doing a series of videos online just to try and sort of demystify cardiology and make it easier for people to understand partly because that's the way I understood it. And, um, and it seemed to resonate with uh, people. And uh, consequently, um, I find myself here in this uh, great place talking to you all. So thank you for having me. Cool. And you have done a few videos with Dare already, right? I have, yes. Uh, yeah. uh, about four or five years ago, we got together and we collaborated. And uh, yes, I did. Yeah. So you, everybody, you can go to the Dear YouTube channel. We have a few videos with Dr. Gupta there talking all things and anxiety and heart sensations. We have, Michelle, how many questions do we have today? Um, one, two, three. <clears throat> I don't know. The numbers fell off of this pager, paper, paper for some reason, but maybe 16 or so. But, okay. um, but despite some of these super specific questions... <laughs> We can also maybe ask some general questions too that maybe we get a lot or Dr. Gupta that you might get a lot because of course we're not just here talking about cardiology but related to anxiety and health anxiety and this comes in a lot and exercise and how do I know that I'm not having a heart attack and like any, any, um, any general questions that you get a lot of that you might be able to maybe we can answer some of these off the bat before we even get into the specific ones that come in but like what what do you hear a lot of i mean i i get uh, contacted by a lot of people with regards to palpitations mm -hmm. uh, particular uh, you know whenever i um particularly palpitations which are described like skipping or fluttering and unfortunately, you know, the medical profession sort of doesn't really pay too much attention to them because they're generally considered benign, but they're actually very debilitating for the sufferer. And because 
I guess, I guess there's two things to say, you know, the way I understand medicine, the way I understand life is that there are really only two aspects to life. One is quantity of life and the second is quality of life. And for the sufferer, the quality of life aspect is very important, even though sometimes our quality of life can be made worse because we're worried about what's going to happen to mm -hmm. us in the future. Now, the medical profession tends to say, well, if it's not going to kill you, then it's not worth worrying about. But, you know, quality of life still matters. So a lot of people still get troubled with their palpitation. They don't feel adequately reassured. That feeds into anxiety and then anxiety causes more. And therefore, I definitely think that there is scope in the medical profession to try and address questions that patients may have. Because in some way, by doing that, by giving them good amounts of reassurance and by paying attention to how that condition affects their quality of life, you do, you know, you make, make it much better for the patient. So uh, I get a lot of people saying, you know, palpitation is something going to happen to me is, is I'm, I'm so worried. Am I going to drop down dead? Am mm -hmm. I going to have a heart attack, etc. And um, I think the easy way to try and describe this or the easy way to explain this is that Palpitation is a symptom. It's what the person says. You know, you can turn around and say, look, I felt something going on with my heart, which doesn't feel normal to me. And that's a palpitation. Uh, and it's very much the patient coming to the doctor and saying, I am feeling something that feels odd. And not all palpitations reflect a heart problem. So you can get palpitations for a variety of different reasons. You can get palpitation because of anxiety. You can get palpitation because you have a hormonal imbalance. Uh, you can get palpitation because you have adrenaline surges, etc. But also sometimes you can get palpitation because you have a heart rhythm abnormality. And that's the thing everyone's worried about. So the first thing I would always say is, it's easy enough. Let's see what your heart is, uh, heart is doing when you have your palpitation. Uh, because if we find that the heart is behaving normally, then we can exclude a heart problem mm -hmm. at that time. The second thing to say is it's very important for people to realize that what does a heart rhythm disturbance even mean? Why do we get so worried about a heart rhythm disturbance? What does that even mean? You know, And the answer is that the heart is first and foremost to pump. Its job is to pump blood around the body. And it does so most effectively at a certain rate and at a certain rhythm, with a certain rhythm. Right? Now, if there's disruption to that rhythm or if the rate is abnormal or anything like that, all it means is that the heart is not going to be able to work as efficiently as it was for the duration of that rhythm. And that's really, really important. So when people say, look, I'm getting palpitations and my heart skips, oh my God, what's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen because actually your heart has become inefficient for a second and then it becomes efficient again. So you're not going to do any damage. Nothing bad's going to happen. And so most people, most cardiologists say the 30 second mark is important. You know, <coughs> if you get any palpitations which settle down or which are interrupted by normal beats within a 30 second period, then those by definition don't tend to be dangerous at all. It is only when you get palpitations that go on for 20 minutes, half an hour. And even then, the, the, the thing that tells you whether there's a dangerous or not is who you are. So if you're a young, fit person, you don't have any comorbidities, in general, hardly any palpitations is going to be dangerous. If you are someone who's 80, who's had two strokes, who's had a heart attack in the past, that uh, is more uh, worrying and that warrants more uh, aggressive investigation. So whenever I see a young, healthy person, um, I, in my mind, know that, yes, we're not dealing with anything dangerous, but it is still important to spend some time and uh, give that patient that reassurance and answer the questions that they see. Great. That's a great answer. You, like, I could just listen to you talk for the next three hours. You're like the Barry version of cardiology, <laughs> right? <laughs> Tell you so right, I was having the same thought. Like, Oh my God, tell me more about my heart pumping. <laughs> it's like a heart meditation. And, and so I want to ask a follow-up question on that because we have a lot of people who um, deal with white coat syndrome. And when they come in, they have maybe doctors or nurses or people in there in the clinics or in the offices that 
don't have a lot of maybe experience with anxiety and it's like, oh, just calm down. And now they're, now their reading is showing, oh, their blood pressure is off and, or they need to go home and they're told to check their blood pressure at home. But every time they put the machine on, whoosh, everything goes up. So they can't get an accurate reading. And then it's kind of like around and around. And then the doctor gives them some blood pressure medication because the reading is high, but the reading is high because they're about to run out of the house. So do you see this come up? Like, how would you address that? This comes up all the time on calls. So I think you are the person to be answering this question. Yeah, this is a major problem. And it's a major problem because of the way uh, medical professionals have made it. Uh, or, so, you know, when we're talking about blood pressure, really, the, the point is this, is it, are we just dealing with a number? Because the number changes all the time. Or are we actually dealing with some kind of process that's going on, some kind of harmful process in the body? And the number is a reflection of that process, right? So to my mind, when if you take um, a person and measure their blood pressure 100 times in the day, you'll get 100 different values. And so we're then told, okay, well, if your blood pressure is above this number, then that means you have high blood pressure. Well, which of those 100 num values mm -hmm. am I going to take to use to compare with this standard number that is given out, you know, by a bunch of people who've never even met me. So I was, it was a very interesting thing. I was uh, fortunate enough to lecture a bunch of doctors and I said, well, you know, uh, there were some doctors from America and there were doctors from Europe. And I said, you know, what is high blood pressure? What is high blood pressure? And the Americans said anything above 120 over 80 is high. And the Europeans said anything above 140 over 90 is high. And I said, great, well, why don't you move all those American hypertensive patients to Europe? And, and they'll be healthy. <laughs> all the problems are gone. They have high blood pressure. How does that, how does that even make sense? <laughs> you know, are we dealing with a process or are we dealing with a bunch of numbers? And therefore, to my mind, the more important thing is to look for process, to look for evidence. To my mind, the definition of high blood pressure is that number that does that person whose number it is some kind of harm. If it is not doing you any harm, it's just a number, who cares what it is? It has to reflect some kind of harm. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, but 20 years down the line, you may have a heart attack. Sure, you may have a heart attack, but can it possibly be that it's not doing anything at a microscopic level in your body and then you have a heart attack and you blame it on the blood pressure? <laughs> or would it be doing something at a, at a lower level um, insidiously that you may want to look at now and decide. And if you, if you think about blood pressure, well, what is blood pressure? Blood pressure is pressure in a container. So the pressure of blood in the blood vessel. And therefore, if the pressure is too high, then the container gets damaged. Surely that's the only, that's the only real relevance of pressure in a, you know, and high blood pressure. So I personally believe that if I'm worried about this, I look for the most fragile containers in the body. And if those fragile containers are not damaged, then I cannot find it, I cannot justify saying, oh, well, you have high blood pressure. You may have a high number, but you do not have any evidence of harm. And therefore, hmm. uh, that to my mind makes a lot more sense than trying to explain that to patients makes so much more sense than just saying, okay, well, your blood pressure is 140 over 80, 130 over 90, 110. You don't know. So whenever you approach a patient with high blood pressure, the first thing is I would always say, look, look, let's look at the most fragile blood vessels in your body, because if the pressure is truly high, they will start getting damaged. And you can visualize them at the back of the eyes. The retina are all red. You can visualize the blood vessel. In a person with high blood pressure, if the blood pressure is truly high, you will start seeing little micro hemorrhages so you can visualize them. Another place where you have tiny blood vessels is the kidneys. And so if the kidney vessels start getting damaged, then the kidneys leak out stuff that they weren't meant to leak out, like protein. So you can dipstick the urine, you can look for something called microalbumin. If your pressure is truly high for you, your heart has to work against that pressure and therefore the heart becomes more muscular. So you can look at the heart if it, and see if it's more muscular. If you don't have any of those things, then I don't think that's such a, I don't think that I can say that that pressure is high for that person. And the other thing I would always do is I would always find one number, not, you know, let's do a blood pressure at nine o'clock, let's do one 10, 30. Which number am I gonna use? 
and so the, the question is, well, you should use the same number that they used in the study that turned around and said, oh, high blood pressure is a bad thing, right? <laughs> so which number did they use? Because they've got uh, volunteers, human beings, who have numbers which fluctuate all day long. So which number did they use? And if you look at all the studies, they use a 24-hour average. And that is done with a machine called an ambulatory blood pressure monitor, which will automatically measure your blood pressure every half an hour when you're awake. And more importantly, every one hour when you're asleep. So now you're asleep when your blood pressure is being measured. And therefore you get a much purer signal. You're not exercising, you're not stressed, you're not in an artificial environment. And most of the studies are now pointing to the fact that actually it is your nighttime blood pressure, which is most reflective of whether something bad's gonna happen to you in the future. And if you look at all those people in whom bad things happen in the future, the ones that do badly are the ones who have evidence of damage, even at the, out, you know, even at the beginning. So people who have retinopathy, people who have kidney uh, leaking protein, those are the people who come to harm. Everyone else just takes the hit, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, because the government and all the departments of health, they can't be bothered to do all that. So they just say, let's treat the blood pressure. Let's treat enough people. And in that way, we'll capture those people who come to harm. Unfortunately, what that means is that the poor patient who doesn't have high blood pressure, A, gets anxious about being told that he may have high blood pressure, mm -hmm. gets labeled uh, so that the insurance claim, insurance goes up and everything, his employers discriminate against him. Three, is put on medications for life. Necessary and medication. Never, never yeah. taken off those medications. Four, develop side effects. And actually, this has been well proven that one in 12 people with supposedly mild high blood pressure don't get any benefit from it, but develop side effects. Then they get put on more tablets for the side effects. And then eventually, when they get a bit older, they start falling because they've been told they have high blood pressure. And actually now they do need a higher blood pressure because all their blood vessels are getting a bit harder and they're older. And now you're dropping the blood pressure too much and they actually fall. So this is a major, major problem. And to my mind, these days, it's a real challenge trying to convince people to actually get them off the medications. You know, we're over-medicating patients and uh, it is not based around any sort of common sense or logic. So tomorrow, everybody's go get a checkup at their cardiologist. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's already looked at their eyes. Who just checked retina. their who just checked their eyes? It's like, where's my retina? Where are my red? Oh, my I'm, blood gonna get up to, I'm gonna get up tonight and measure my blood pressure. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, Emma's like me. Everybody's <laughs> looking in their eyes, see what popped. <laughs> <laughs> when they're uh, participating in uh, you know weightlifting competitions their blood pressure just shoots right up you know when they lift nothing bad happens to them it, okay. because the number doesn't matter it is a process it is an underlying process if there's an insidious underlying harmful process then the blood pressure is a reflection of that and it actually if you think about it it just doesn't make sense to treat the number because the number is a symptom of some kind of underlying unhappy process that's going on which may be uh, because of uh, lifestyle, etc. So in some ways, what we do is we're doing patients a disservice because maybe their bodies are screaming out and saying, look, you're working me too hard. I'm not getting enough rest. I'm not eating the right things. I'm leading a bad lifestyle. My numbers start going up. So instead, what doctors should turn around and say is, look, actually, let's sort the underlying problem out. What they do do, though, is they uh, they uh, soften the screen, they quieten the screen by lowering the blood pressure, right? Mm. The unhappy body, the processes continue. So the next thing that will happen is your blood sugar start going up. And then you go to the doctor and they say, ah, oh, now you're diabetic as well. So mm. let's give you another medication. And actually you're not doing anything. You're just masking symptoms. You're not tackling the underlying process. And that is so, so important because that is why we're seeing all, all this polypharmacy, all this multimorbidity. If you think, Everyone who has diabetes, has high blood pressure, has fatty liver, has sleep apnea, has um, uh, you know, um, obesity, all these things hang around together. And that's probably because we're not targeting our lifestyle, but instead we're just masking every symptom as it arises, you know, and that I think is a real problem then. Right. Cool. And I also do have a question, Dr. Gupta, and I think uh, a lot of people are very much interested in hearing your response to that, because don't we all hear all the time on all channels how bad stress just is on our body and that it can actually kill us? 
Now, people going through anxiety, they do experience a lot of internal stress, especially. So would you say this stress can be harmful in our body? Or would you rather say, look, it's really uncomfortable, but your stress system can handle that? Well, the thing is, you know, again, stress uh, certainly impacts on your quality of life. And for the patient, that's all that matters, really. I know we can, we, we're worried about our length of life, but actually we will never realize how long we live. All we really know is our quality of life. And stress takes the joy out of our quality of lives. Now, the question is, does stress contribute to bad things happening to you? And I have no doubt that it does. You know, so if you take people, for example, um, who have... Um, who have a depressive illness, for example. So people with depression do worse than people who don't have depression if they have heart disease. So a person who has heart disease and has depression will do much worse than a person who has heart disease but is not clinically depressed. So I think I definitely think stress is bad for us. There is absolutely no doubt about it, both in terms of length of life and quality of life. What I can categorically say is it does take, it does uh, impact on our quality of lives. And wherever possible, I think it's a really good idea for people to look at that and say, okay, well, you know, maybe I can handle it at the moment, but in the long run, what impact is it going to have? What impact is it going to have on my mental health? What is the impact is it going to have on my physical health? Uh, and I think, I think uh, you know, I think I would say stress is probably one of the biggest killers in the world. You know, I, I definitely feel that. And when I see patients who come in with heart disease, et cetera, they may do everything right, but stress is ubiquitous these days. It's everywhere. So a lot of people will say, okay, I want to, I go to the gym and I eat healthy, but very few people come and say, I really pay attention to my sleep. I really pay attention to my stress. Uh, and I think even though we hear it all the time, it is one of those things that people don't target as much in their day-to-day -day lives. Right. And although, it, although other than our group here, because before the chat starts freaking out, also it's less about, we, we tend to get a lot of people who try and get rid of all stressors because can't have too many stressors because they can't do too much. I can only work a couple hours a day because I have anxiety. I have to reduce my stress. It's almost like we like to take it to the nth degree. And it's more about how I navigate stress, how I approach stress, how I treat stress. And we tend to have people, we swing to the opposite direction of avoid stress because I don't want to die and no, don't stress me out. And I have to calm down and meditate to get rid of, but it's actually the fight getting rid of that creates the stress. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe to specify my question a little bit more, maybe it was too, too vague. So I think there is self-made stress that you can control by having just a better schedule, better lifestyle. But people who go through, through acute anxiety, they feel very, very stressed. And this is not something they can directly control. And those people usually worry then, oh my God, I am so sensitized. Oh my God, I do have panic attacks on and on. Oh my God, will they harm me? So Don't do you get have stressed about being stressed. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any word for reassurance for them? Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, you know, a lot of my work involves meeting people who have anxiety and who have stress. And really, if you are otherwise fit and well, if you're otherwise healthy, then generally your body will cope with the stress. So, you know, the, we in, in medicine, you know, you come across a lot of people that are described as being the worried well. Mm -hmm. And the worried well generally do well. They, there's nothing bad happens to them. But if you're a, a 50 year old, for example, and you're stressed, and because you're stressed, you don't eat right, so you pile on the weight and you're piling on the weight and then uh, you start taking medication <coughs> because you because of the weight you get uh, diabetes, then you start taking medications and you're not really doing anything and realizing that maybe you need to modify, you know, it's not, it's not, the, it's not kind of anxiety stress that I mean. What mm -hmm. I mean is a different kind of stress. Uh, I'm not talking about anxiety as such. And what I'm talking about is the stress that we go through where we're working night shifts and then we're getting up in the morning and we're not eating properly and we're going mm -hmm. back that kind of rat race that people fall into where they're not even actually conscious you know a lot of your viewers are very conscious about their health 
uh, but there is a different kind of person who is not conscious of their health at all because they don't have the time because all they're doing is taking on work and overloading their bodies and not sleeping and, and that stress I think is very bad yeah. uh, but if you're otherwise you know doing everything you can then the, the heart will cope you know in that sense stress is no different anxiety is no different to you know, to the heart working harder during exercise or anything like that. A lot of the anxiety side of things is the is the mental side and, you know, how it can actually deplete you of joy. But we don't see anxiety as something that directly causes heart disease. But we do see sort of the kind of day-to-day -day living where people are just so stressed that they just do not have time for anything. Right. Uh, that I think is very harmful. Would you say that because we're meant to live in survival mode to survive through danger for short periods of time? Yeah. Right. But if we're constantly, if we're not actually surviving danger, but if it's, I got to get to this meeting and I got to do this and I have to do this and working here, you're keeping yourself in survival mode and your body is in this constant stress state as if everything we do is do or die, must or else. Right, that black or white thinking we some we we tend to get into with anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, you know, stress, chronic stress, uh, along with everything else that it accompanies, is very inflammatory to the body. But but uh, you know, being otherwise healthy and looking after yourself is the best you can do. And certainly, you know, it's easy for people like me to say, oh well, you know calm your anxiety but that that's just how some people are you you can't it's not you can't just switch off you know if you're if you've been a certain way uh, so of course what i would say in those people is don't make your anxiety worse about worrying about your heart <laughs> <laughs> right just concentrate, concentrate on on just improving your quality of life uh, and i think that's what it should all boil down to it should always be about our quality of lives and making sure that we have time to spend um, on our health, maybe making sure that we have time to invest in ourselves, and often we don't, and making sure that you're spending time with the people who, who love you and who care for you. And as long as you're doing that, you're doing the best you can in terms of making your quality of life right. Mm -hmm. In terms of length of life, which a lot of anxiety and you know things are about, it's about what's gonna happen to me, the reality is no one knows, you know, as an individual, I could be talking to you and something bad could happen to me tomorrow, but I have no Knock control. on wood, knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> but this is that one, this is the question everybody gets stuck on, like, mm -hmm. my heart is racing, but how do I know? How do I know I shouldn't go to the emergency room for the 15th time this month? How do I know it's not a heart attack? Better be safe than sorry. And so we get stuck. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would throw their hands up right now and say, yeah, me, I'd rather just go to the ER just in case, but I always end up fine. But then we, you know, we start losing trust in our body and trust in our body's ability to just sort of live. And then it's this constant question. So this comes up a lot, like, how do you know? And, you know, we always say like, kind of don't, <laughs> you know, you don't, you know, there, you don't, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for certainty. And so it's like learning how to grow trust back in your body. But I mean, would you have anything else to add to, uh, yeah. So that like, how do I know this is definitely not a heart attack right now? Because it feels like one or it feels like I'm about to have one. Well, I can I can tell you I can tell you my insight. So, you know, through my own kind of work that I do and my colleagues, we can tell, right? When someone comes to us, we can tell in our own minds as to whether whether we think there's something serious going on or not. And we base it more on who the patient is rather than what they're complaining of mm. so uh, you know typical cardiac chest pain is described as a crushing sensation over the chest like someone sitting on your chest um, and if someone comes in and says look i'm getting some stabbing pains on the left side of my chest then we in our minds are thinking that's not cardiac you know cardiac pain is this however if a 19 year old comes to me and says you know yesterday i woke up and i had a crushing pain in my chest immediately my threshold for thinking oh my god this is heart is way i'm not thinking that it's heart i'm thinking it could be anything else but heart even though he's <laughs> describing very typical symptoms but if an 80 year old comes and describes a really atypical symptom like oh i've got stabbing i'm still wanting to investigate it and it is more about who you are than necessarily what you how it feels to you 
you know, if you are older, bad things happen to old sick people and you take everything seriously. If you're young, you're healthy, you're able to do lots of sport, you've never had a problem one night, you have a problem. I would say it's okay, you should go and get checked out because you know you could be that one person in whom there is something going on. But once you've been checked out and you have that reassurance that everything is normal, if those symptoms occur again, then it's highly, highly unlikely that suddenly something has changed, very unlikely. Mm -hmm. In an elderly person, I would always say, go get checked out. And the problem that we face is we never know ourselves when we become elderly, right? Because our minds still some remain young. Uh, but I think if you're above the age of 50 and you are starting to get symptoms, then it's not unreasonable to get checked out. Uh, the one thing I would say is that if you think about it, there are only three things that can go wrong with the heart. Okay, Despite all the complexity that's out there, I've thought about it, there are only three things that can go wrong with the heart. Number one, the heart is a pump, and that pump could be faulty. So you could be born with a weak pump. You could have damaged your pump in some way, so the pump isn't pumping as much blood around, and that can be a dangerous problem. Uh, so these days we have a test called echocardiography, ultrasound of the heart, and that's a very accessible test, very easy to get. And if someone looks at that and says, look, you know, your heart looks fine, then you do not have a faulty pump. So you can put that to the side and not worry about that. The second problem that happens is that the pump may be fine, but the blood supply to that pump may be interrupted. So... Um, you know, if uh, that's what happens with heart attacks, you know, the pump is fine, you've got a strong heart, but for some reason the blood supply is interrupted, so the heart dies and therefore people have heart attacks, etc. These days, two things will tell you about that. One, if your symptoms do not get worse on exercise, then it is highly unlikely that there's a problem with the blood supply to the heart. And two, there are now tests where you can delineate the heart arteries. And if your heart arteries are fine, then you can put that to the side. The third problem that can happen with the heart is that the heart is an electrical organ. So you can have a malfunction of the electricity of the heart, and that can be a heart rhythm disturbance, et cetera. As I was saying, the, you, the problem is you can never tell that in advance. You will only be able to tell that after it's happened. So. Mm -hmm anyone could be sitting there and you develop a heart rhythm disturbance, there is no test that will tell you, oh, you will never develop a heart rhythm disturbance or you will never develop palpitation. You can only diagnose after it's happened. But what the tests do tell you is if you've got a strong pump and if you've got good blood supply to that pump, no matter what the electrical disturbance is, your heart will cope. Your heart will cope and you will be able to easily make it to a place where someone can diagnose it and they can then correct it for you. So the point I'm trying to make is if you're a healthy person and you've had your basic investigations, like a heart scan, and you know that you know, you've had some kind of stress test and you've passed those, then your heart will cope and you're not going to be in danger. Did you hear that, Emma? Did you hear that? <laughs> and once you get a full workup like that, how often would you recommend going back for uh, anything? I would say if you are under the age of 40, then I don't think you need to have another worker. I think on the other hand, if you're uh, older, then uh, I would usually say if something changes, you need another workup. So mm -hmm. if you have symptoms and then you start getting symptoms, you should have another workup. But uh, otherwise I'd say five years probably. Okay. All right. And you know, something else came up a few times in the chat and was sent in a couple of times also. Um, about POTS, yeah. um, you know, tachycardia related to POTS, um, heart rate, um, you know, the, the passing out, feeling the dizzy all related. Could you address POTS in your yeah. experience with this? And we have a lot of people dealing with POTS and anxiety. Yeah, so POTS is a, is a poorly understood condition. It's poorly recognized, but it is incredibly common. And uh, POTS is a very, the POTS basically stands for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, meaning that patients with POTS generally don't like being stood up for a prolonged period of time. And when they do stand up for a prolonged period of time, their heart rate goes up excessively high by more than 30 beats per minute, and they don't like it. And they either feel like they're gonna pass out or they get palpitations. And basically they wanna come back 
and lie down or recline or something. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. However, I think that the people, if you talk to patients with POTS, the truth is that although they are worse when they're standing up, they feel rubbish all the time, regardless. So when you speak with patients with POTS, they will say that, yeah, even when I'm not standing up, I'm so tired, I've got bad brain fog, I never wake up feeling refreshed, I've got temperature dysregulation, I get headaches, I get IBS-like symptoms, I get urine reflux. They're virtually every organ in their body sort of misbehaving. Yes, they're much worse when they stand up, but otherwise they're not and they're not standing up. So when we think of POTS, the definition doesn't capture all that. It only captures mm -hmm. the bit which is about standing up. And therefore, a better term than POTS is something called autonomia. And in Sorry, can you say that again? Can you say that again? A, it's also sorry, called while you're term, clicked out. Dysautonomia. Sorry, dysautonomia. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. You were a little choppy for a couple of minutes. <laughs> so the, the term dysautonomia captures all the symptoms that patients with POTS have. And dysautonomia means that there's an imbalance between your autonomic functions. So between your flight and fight and your rest and digest systems, there's an imbalance. So if you look at all the symptoms that patients with POTS will get, they're all either to do with too much flight or fight and too little rest and digest. Mm -hmm. So in, in essence, what happens is, if I could explain it to you, it's almost like we're nicely balanced between our rest and digest and flight and fight systems. I come along and I say, boo. And so I will scare you. Your heart rate will go up. Uh, you'll get red. Uh, you'll get hot, you'll get, you know, you can lose your mind, so to speak, when people get uh, stressed. They can't possibly rest, they can't possibly digest. So with time, everything settles down and everything returns back to normal. If I really scare you hard, you get a much bigger response. And then over a period of time, everything settles down. In POTS, what is happening is that the pivot has moved this way. Mm. So now, small triggers, huge rises in adrenaline. So a lot of patients with POTS will say, look, people tell me I'm anxious and I feel I'm not, I, I'm not even feeling anxious, but why do I behave as I'm anxious, as if I'm, there's nothing for me to be anxious about, mm -hmm. yet everyone says I'm anxious. And the reason is that in some ways it's an overreaction, but it's a biochemical overreaction. These patients produce too much adrenaline with a, a minor um, trigger and therefore they will behave like they're anxious because they've just got too much adrenaline. It's a biochemical right. overreaction, not a mental overreaction. Mm -hmm. So a patient with POTS, if they're walking along with their husband or wife and they walk along and a cat crosses their path, suddenly the husband, the partner will produce the adrenaline associated with seeing a cat. The patient with POTS will produce the adrenaline see associated with seeing a lion. Mm -hmm. Now what will happen is that the person will look at, the, at the, this patient next to them and say, gosh, you're being anxious because, mm -hmm. you know, why are you reacting like this? Because we've just seen a cat, right? And, and this poor patient says, I know we've just seen a cat. I don't know why I'm reacting like this because they have this biochemical mm -hmm. over-exaggerated response, over-exaggerated production of adrenaline. So that's and what, what are the causes of this condition? So the majority of times, I think it's a genetic vulnerability. So a lot of people have a condition called joint hypermobility syndrome, where all their blood vessels are a little bit lax. And what happens in these people is, for some reason, what tends to happen is they tend to get these dysautonomic symptoms. However, most people are okay, and then some kind of trigger happens. So it could be trauma, it could be infection, like uh, Epstein glandular fever. It could be COVID, and that's why we're seeing so many people with long COVID. Yeah, we've had a few COVID uh, questions come up here too. <laughs> so long COVID is a dysautonomia. They have symptoms which are very, very similar to POTS. And actually, if you speak to a lot of long COVID people, they'll say, actually, you know, I have felt awful since I got COVID. But when I look back, I wasn't quite right. There was stuff mm -hmm. going on even then. But I just thought that was me. I used to be tired. I tended to get more tired than most people. I tend to get a bit more dizzy than most people. I have a history of IBS. I have a history of joint pain. And it's only when everything flares up after an infection, trauma, road traffic accidents, surgery, period of extreme stress, mm. 
puberty, when you have a growth spread, those kind of things, suddenly the genie comes out of the lamp and then uh, the poor patient spends a long time trying to get the genie back in. So these are people who have a lamp with the genie in it and some kind of trigger comes along and the genie comes out. Wow. So um, would you advise everybody who has concerns about their heart to, to get a checkup and if they experience any of the symptoms that you just mentioned to ask their doctor if it is possible they might be suffering from that? I would, because I think the, the problem with uh, something like POTS is all the symptoms are a little bit more specific, right? So you go and say, look, I'm tired. And everyone will say like, yeah, so what? So I'm tired as well. Everyone's tired, right? and Everybody's then, tired. <laughs> you know, really refreshed. Oh, well, you know, no one really puts it together. So all the symptoms are a little bit nonspecific, extremely debilitating, especially for the patient when they're all put together. Mm -hmm. uh, but Doctors don't pay too much attention to them because they, they're they not like a hardcore symptom. Uh, and, and so I think whenever a patient has those symptoms and they've been going on for a while and they're bad enough to be debilitating the patient, it is important to get checked out. And it is important to look at autonomic function or go and see someone who has an interest in this. And particularly the long COVID patients, I think it's really important for them to get checked out. And the reason I say this is because you know, medics are protocol bound, right? So uh, unless a study comes along and says, oh, you can try this drug in long COVID and it'll work, no one's going to try anything. So until then, it's just going to be, yeah, just pace yourself, keep hydrated, you know, and we'll just check on you. Self-care, a lot of self-care. <laughs> to my mind, I think to myself, well, my patients are suffering. Am I going to wait? Am I going to wait for some study to come out to tell me what to do? Or am I just going to try and put myself out of my comfort zone and give them the things that seem to work mm -hmm. so for people who have very similar symptoms? So people with POTS that I manage have very similar symptoms to people with long COVID. When I give my medicines to POTS patients, they get better. Because these patients are coming with long COVID, which is essentially a post-viral dysautonomia, uh, why not try the same medications and see what happens because they have the same symptoms mm -hmm. and when I do that people get better mm -hmm. uh, the problem is unless you go to someone who has an interest in this and who's invested in this uh, you would end up just being at the mercy of well there's no evidence for that there's no evidence we've got to start making our own evidence we can't sit there and wait for some drug company to run a trial with their expensive drug and then come and tell us Let's get people who are suffering to doctors who are interested in relieving them of their suffering. And let's see what happens. And now your schedule is booked I for the rest of the year. But on that note, Dr. Gupta, can people call you for virtual consultations? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we have a website and, um, and uh, of course, you know, I, I, we are, I, I do do that. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always willing to help and advise. Obviously I cannot manage people who are not in the same country as me, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I have had a lot of people with COVID, et cetera, contact me. And then, you know, just getting them to be able to advocate for themselves, just- okay. Even information to bring to their doctors or to look for a doctor yeah. who would be open to exploring things that you would be open to exploring it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Just empowering the patient is so important because otherwise the poor patient is at loss. You don't know where to go. You don't know who to speak with. But just to have that confidence of knowing that there are people like you and those people are getting better. Mm -hmm. They're getting better because they have managed to find a good healthcare professional who's willing to be open-minded, who's willing right. to be patient-centered, not protocol-centered. Right. Uh, and once you find people like that, then there is absolutely no reason why patients can't improve. And we see this all the time, that patients come in and, you know, it's not a case of, oh, here's a pill and they become magically transformed, but uh, virtually everyone comes back and says, you know, thank God, at least you're trying. At least you're trying something. Mm -hmm. At yeah. least I feel that there's something to work with. Otherwise, I'm just sitting there uh, for my next appointment in six months when I know I'll just be told to just look after myself a bit more. Right. And, you know, everybody listening in on this, either live or who hears back on this, remember, we're kind of like combining two worlds here. We're talking about your heart and we're also talking about anxiety about your heart. And so remember, it's kind of two different things that you can put together. It's 
here's some information about your heart, kind of like Dr. Winston's call last month. Like, here's how thoughts work and here's how brains work so that you have the basic understanding of how bodies and brains work. And when you have that understanding, then our job, Aida and I, are to teach you how to leave shit alone. <laughs> leave it alone. Oh, your heart's good. Your heart's fine. Oh, you're, it's still doing things you don't like. Leave it alone. And it's the leave it alone part where we kind of get stuck on, but what if, oh, but I, but it's still skipping beats, but you were told that the skip beats are fine. You're healthy. What you're stuck in is, but what if it's not right here in the present, trying to fight off the future, honed in focus on your heart, paying close attention. Every time I exercise, it goes up. That means I'm going to die. Right. The storytelling, all the stuff we do about, I mean, feel free if your thing is heart. And your thing is non-intrusive thoughts, go listen to the intrusive thoughts webinar we did last week. And you'll see weirdly, it's the same thing. It's how we treat our thoughts. It's how we treat our heart. If you're having anxiety about your heart, you're not having a heart problem. You're having a, how you treat your heart problem. Does that make sense guys? Exactly. And the sad thing, the saddest thing about all this is how we lose trust in our heart. That makes mm -hmm. me sad. Yeah. I think it is sad. It's, it's feeding for us our entire life without our doing, without we observing it, telling it what to do. And I, I bring this analogy up every call because it's my favorite analogy, most favorite analogy in the world, the one Michelle came up with. How does your body how does your heart and your cardiovascular system know how to get into e gear, get into action when you go for a jog? You don't go out and you say, hey, heart, come on, we're going for a 5K. Please start beating. <laughs> and when you come home, you don't say, okay, heart, I'm at home, I'm at home, calm down, calm down. Crank it down yourself, change all the cogs <laughs> and the settings. Yeah. yeah, your body just does it. You know, yeah. I had a great, I had a, a client who came in and they had a great doctor and um, they were, the doctor was, their medical doctor was telling them, you know, all of your different systems and all of your different organs fluctuate. There's fluctuation in all different systems. Those, but the ones we notice are your heart, your lungs, and your stomach, because those are the things that are most observable. Those nobody comes in with a fluctuating spleen, but your spleen fluctuates. Your kidneys, like things don't, aren't always do, 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 forever and ever. There's slight fluctuations, but it's the noticeable ones are the ones we then treat as danger because we've noticed the fluctuations. Meanwhile, our body is a fluctuating system. It's just, there's some fluctuations going on that are off our radar. Exactly. And regaining that trust, letting go of, of that control that never works by the way, right? Why does anxiety come up? Because we try to control, but we fail at doing so. And then we're like, Oh God, but I feel out of control. And, and regaining that trust by surrendering to again to your body, I think that is a very, very important step. And it feels so much better. <laughs> yeah. And it comes down again to quality of life or how long it's going to be. Because if you're, feel free to spend all day waiting to have a heart attack. I mean, yeah. you can do that for the rest of your life. But guess what? If you end up having a heart attack, you're going to be dealing with a heart attack the same time anyway. And so all of those years, we think we're like, it's, it's well, it's well intended, but it doesn't serve us well because it, all it does is that's where the anxiety comes from waiting for something bad to happen, acting as if something bad is just about to happen. And we take a present discomfort and we hook it to this worst case scenario. So every palpitation, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a heart attack. Oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. And it's, that's the part we want to address here too. Uh, and Something also that's come up on a question, a couple questions on here and a few times in the chat, Dr. Gupta, can you please talk about the Apple watches and the blood pressure machines and the testing at home and everybody constantly checking and testing to see, is this something you ever recommend doing? Uh, well, um, yeah, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, the first thing I would say is just following on from what you say, I think it's really important to understand one thing. Worrying doesn't stop us dying. Worrying stops us living. Mm -hmm. that, that I think is really, really incredibly important. And second thing is, much as we'd love it, no one has any control over what's going to happen in the future. Much as we'd love to think we do, we don't. And in some ways, that knowledge can do two things you could use it to enslave you 
Uh, and, and that is what happens with anxiety. You get enslaved. The door is open, but you are in your own prison. You, or you can use that knowledge to liberate you and say, mm -hmm. Hang on, you know, so if I don't have any control over what's going to happen to me, then all I have control over is today, what I am doing now. And in some ways, that realization and that liberation can be incredibly uh, empowering. Now, in terms of monitoring, you know, the reality is, again, I think it's only worth, I mean, let's talk about blood pressure machines, okay? I, I was just talking to someone today and I said, well, why, what do these blood pressure machines offer anyone? What do they actually do? Because if you take a normal person and measure their blood pressure, the blood pressure fluctuates all day long. Right. What do you do with that? You know, Check it again. <laughs> what, what are you gonna do? Is that actually, I mean, it's only worth doing something with that if you, it's only worth measuring that if you're going to do something with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I the, say that all the time. I'm like, you know, you're not a cardiologist. You're not going to check your blood pressure and go, oh, that number is bad, and then perform open heart surgery on yourself. You're you're gonna, and it get it becomes a checking cycle where it's, oh, I don't like the number. I check it again, or I like the number, and ah, and so you're almost checking it because of anxiety, not even because of your heart. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So the way I say to people, I say, well, if you want to know about your blood pressure have this 24 hour blood pressure monitor. If it's fine, never measure your blood pressure again. And if it's fine- <laughs> You hear that everybody. Then, then, let's do, then let's do something about it. And then repeat the same test, compare apples with apples. So do a 24 hour blood pressure monitor, do something and repeat the 24 hour blood pressure. But there's no point because that's the number you're going to rely on. So all those hundreds of numbers that you're recording the mean in well have no meaning whatsoever. So. So I don't see any point. I don't see any point in having uh, blood pressure machines at home because I don't think I don't see how they serve any purpose other than the patient just saying, "Oh, I recorded it. it looks okay." Oh, you know, they have no meaning personally. They're horribly inaccurate mm -hmm. uh, as well. And then the second thing is with again with the heart rate monitors again. You know, ultimately all you want is you want you want the your you, we try we want to treat symptoms so unless you have any symptoms what are you going to do with that what are you going to do with that number so if you got you know you said okay i got terrible palpitations and my heart rate was 150 fine great get a heart monitor let's see what it is if your heart is consistently normal of normal rhythm during that time that's it all done you don't need to do any more um so Again, I, I do think that having those monitors um, at home just breed more and more anxiety and people end up spending more and more time getting obsessed about them. And mm -hmm. I don't think they serve a purpose. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I would say if you are young, if you're healthy, if you're otherwise free of any comorbidities, you checking your pulse 100 times a day is not going to make you live any longer than someone who doesn't choose in the same boat. Yeah. yeah. And, and and I tend to be... be... Oh. Can you hear me? I just came up echoing. It yeah. came. To, it tends to be pretty biased too, right? Where you're like, whoa, I'm feeling pretty anxious. Oh, I noticed my heart rate's up. Let's check my heart rate. Oh my gosh, it is up. And then we get anxious because our heart rate's up. And then our heart rate's up because we're anxious. Um, you know, or somebody mm. wakes up in the middle of the night and they're like, whoa, I feel like my heart rate's up or I better check my blood pressure. And it's some crazy high number. And then like, well, maybe it didn't do it just right. And every number after that is great they remember that one number and then it continues and that's why it's it's more of a checking 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 issue than a, a cardiac issue mm -hmm. and i always tell my clients look you can come back to the apple watch or to anything else that you use when you come from a place of curiosity mm -hmm. the intention is important if, if you're doing that i love my apple watch i admit <laughs> I don't go out without it, but not to check, oh, am I in some danger or to try to control my heart rate, but it's just a means of curiosity. And we make fun of it because my mom and I, we go for, for jogs a few times a week. And it's so funny because I jog very slowly and my heart rate always has been always very, very high. Slight jog, my heart rate is 160, 170, no problem, but I feel fine. And my mom's like at 125. And I'm like, ha ha, mom, let's compare heart rates. And she would go pale. She was like, are you sure you're okay? Are you sure you're okay? Like, yeah, I'm okay. That's fine. <laughs> right? So curious, intention is important. Are you curious about it or are you trying to control? And if you're trying to control, leave it be.
Yeah. Are you using those monitors to keep you alive? Right. Like, as if like, it's going to tell me when I'm about to explode because originally those fitness monitors are really like, Oh, you know, you'll get in a good cardiac workout if you get your heart up to X amount of beats per minute. And we're using it the opposite way. Oh, my God, don't get up too high. I'm about to die. And it's like, it's not monitoring how close you are to death. It's just monitoring what your body's doing right now. So chances are, if you are anxious and in a heightened state, your body's going to come right up to a heightened state with you. And if you're trying to get rid of the heightened state, it doesn't work like that. When you are calm, your body will calm itself back down. You don't come up and then calm it down. Yeah. And um, Dr. Gupta, please correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of anxious people, they, they, they always fear if their heart beats rapidly for a long time, that that might be dangerous. But if you look at marathon runners Marathons. or at sprinters, right, nothing ever happens. So yeah. could you talk just a little bit about that? Absolutely. I mean, the heart, uh, you know, we have patients uh, whose hearts beat at 120 all the time, people with POTS and people like that. The heart does not... Um, the heart does not um, weaken, nothing bad happens. So I would certainly reassure people that a fast heart rate does not cause the heart to weaken. Even in those people who have a fast heart rhythm disturbance, so they let's say they have AFib or something like that, and if, they, if, if you leave the AFib to go at 160, and there are lots of people out there with that, in a small proportion of them, they develop something called a tachycardia-induced myopathy, cardiomyopathy, meaning that over a period of time, the heart does weaken. But that is a reversible weakening. So when you identify it and you control the heart rate, then the heart strengthens back up. So none of this is anything which means, oh, my God, uh, death is imminent or anything like that. And I certainly wouldn't be worried about that. So your next panic attack, guys, if you happen to have one today, try to look at it as a, a, a workout for your heart, right? Rather than the, the harbing off of something, something serious. And, and I just want to read off just quickly, just a couple of, I know we're not going to specifically answer them all, but I hope, I want you guys to hear them read so you can see how it's tied into all of this. So some of these are, um, you know, experienced tachycardia at rest um, after having long haul, haul COVID and anxiety. We've talked about this, um, anxiety and fatigue, anxiety and AFib. The connection between ectopics and the oh the gastrointestinal system we actually didn't talk about that um, is it a good thing if ectopics go away with regular exercise what can someone help do to help panic attacks during exercise is there an issue with the heart can long term constant anxiety cause heart damage or a heart attack um, I'm 24 here's a great example for exactly what you described I'm 24 years old I have GAD with panic disorder I have ruled out ECG an echo lipid profile all came to be normal, but sometimes my heart beats so fast beating. I can feel it. Is it, it's so hard to concentrate on something else. And then I feel like chest pain in several points in my chest. Is it normal to get a heart rate around one, 100 to 110 for most of the day when you were extremely anxious in parentheses, I had the all clear on EKG and heart monitor and blood pressure normal. So, oh, oh here also have an unhealthy need to regularly check my pulse oximeter. Do you guys see all the, the correlations, how like, that's why we don't go through and specifically ask and answer and ask and answer. We kind of, you, can you guys see how 90% of all of that, what I just read were, was really just answered? I wanna make sure everybody sees it. So it's not always the specific questions that we might not be able to get to all the specific ones, but you see, oh, I'm concerned about my heart. Okay, get your heart checked. Oh, the doctor said my heart's fine. Great, our job, leave it alone. Leave it alone. But I don't trust my doctor. That, and that comes, I don't trust my doctor. I don't trust the readings. I don't trust my heart. I don't trust that I'm going to be okay. And then it becomes kind of like a trust issue, let alone less, less than a heart issue. I think, I think one of the interesting things is I get uh, contacted a lot by patients and they'll say, look, you know, I've had palpitations for 20 years mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm really worried, you know. And so I say to them, do you know, you're worried about what's going to happen to you in the future, you know, and you basically what you want is the a test that tells you that you're going to be OK. And actually, the best test in the world is the test of time. 
So if you can <laughs> look back and say 20 years ago, I was worried and actually I'm here and I'm still alive and I'm still well uh, 20 years down the line, then it is highly, 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 highly unlikely that this is now going to kill you in the next five years or one mm -hmm. year or whatever. You know, so it is very, very important to bear that in mind. A lot of people will say, yeah, I've had them for 20 years and I've, I've got two five-year-olds and I want to be around for them. And I said, well, you've known your palpitations for 20 years and you've only known your children for five years. <laughs> of your palpitations. <laughs> How does that make sense? You know, and it's really important for people to understand that. Actually, for a lot of people um, with generalized anxiety disorder, et cetera, those symptoms will have gone on for a long time. And if the longer the symptom has been going on for, the more confident I feel that there's nothing dangerous going on. You know, the longer, the, in some ways, that is your strength. The strength of knowing that actually I've had this and nothing bad has happened to me. And, and that, to my mind, is the best evidence that this is not something that is going to harm you because nothing bad has happened to you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you say, okay, well, it's only started for the last three days, of course, go and check, get checked out. It's good to get checked out. But if it's been going on for two years, three years, highly, highly, highly unlikely that anything bad's gonna happen to you. If something bad's gonna happen to you, it's gonna be for something else, not for this thing that you've been worrying about. Ah, did you hear that, guys? <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice. Wonderful. I think our time is up. Or do we have, Michelle, do we have any question, important question that we, we kind of got everything like here's information about your heart here's how to get it checked and once you get it checked if you're still having those things come up apparently those things are normal apparently those things are just your body's fluctuation and then it's how i change my relationship with my body's fluctuation right how i stop treating everything as danger about to be danger what should i do well what if this and so like that becomes the anxiety problem. How like anxiety about your heart doesn't mean I need to keep scrolling through Google about on heart websites. If you're going, if you're spending your day on cardiology websites and you are not a cardiologist and you are not getting continuing education units for your degrees, stay off of them. Or you're just interested in them because, oh, I like hearts. I want to learn more about them rather than well, this guy had a heart attack when he was 24. I'm 24. What if I have? That's what we're trying to change here. Physically get checked. We say this all the time. If you're, if something health wise you think might be going on with you, go to a health expert. And when you get the tests, that's your kind of your answer, right? And you can always follow up. Of course, that's what doctors are there for because there may or may not be something wrong. So you may have some anticipatory anxiety leading up to the results. And then after that, that's where you practice letting go because you don't let go because of certainty. Like if there was blood work to say, oh, it turns out there's some new genetic test that 100% accurate, I will not die from a heart attack. Nobody's going to have anxiety about their heart anymore. You all will find anxiety about something else, right? Now we'll start like fighting something else, but it'll be like, Oh, apparently this thing's normal because it's impossible. See, we always, we always kind of function on uncertainty. And so every time that your body does something different there, that leads to uncertainty. But that's really the majority of these. My worry, what if, feels like it's gonna, like, how do I, how do I leave it alone? And it's, that's the dare stuff, right? Here's the, the cardiology piece. Here's information about your heart, how it works, how it functions. And it, and a normal heart does a lot of weird things, right? It's not just a constant, oh, if I get back to normal, everything will be perfect like this forever for the rest of my life. It's maybe your normal is not the normal you think it's supposed to be. And it's getting used to what your body does, right? And learning how to kind of not, not act as if it's always about to be dangerous. Cool. So Dr. Gupta, where can people find you online? Uh, what, what is your website? So um, my YouTube channel is called Your Cardiology. Mm -hmm. I'm going to write it in the chat. Yeah, Your Cardiology is the YouTube mm -hmm. channel. And there's quite a lot of um, videos there on mm -hmm. the heart palpitations, etc. And I sort of uh, tell patients that, you know, uh, do check it out because um, you might find it interesting or I'll bore you to sleep and sleep is exceptionally good. <laughs> 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 can't lose, right? So if nothing else, what you just said that I can bore you to sleep. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, you know, again, 
I think it's really important to focus on the fact that you can worry about your heart all day long and still have a brick land in your head. You can worry about your heart all day long and still have a car accident. And a lot of people come to me and say, look, you know, I'm worried about my heart. I've got two young daughters. I want to be there for them in 10 years. And I say, well, be there for them now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's it. And, and that's it. And as long as you do that bit today, that's all you need to do. That is mm -hmm. all that you, that you have achieved something and that's it. And then face tomorrow when it comes along and do the same tomorrow. And before you know it, your concerns about your future will dissipate and you will be so involved in living for the day, which is what we should all be doing. Uh, ultimately, there are a million and one ways to die. You know, what we've got to learn to do is not worry about that. We've got to learn how to live. The door is open. We are in a self-imposed prison. All you need to do is have the courage to open the door and look outside and you'll realize that actually nothing bad's going to happen outside. It is a little bit like that kind of mentality where, you know, uh, they talk about prisoners and, you know, prisoners are scared of going out because they're, they're scared of that world because mm -hmm. they're used to that world that they're in. But actually, there is nothing terrible out there. You just go out there and you get used to it. And when you get used to it, you'll actually enjoy your life. Wonderful words. In awesome. closing. Thank, Thank you, you so you much so for much. joining us. I think we have a lot of happy uh, DARE um, members here. Yeah. So um, great. This, this uh, webinar will be posted on the app as usual. And I have posted the YouTube channel in the, in the chat. And your website was yourcardiology.com UK. Cardiology.co.uk. Uh, yeah, okay. and there's actually all my all my videos are actually written now, so you can actually read them. Uh, and that is on uh, another website called Dr. Sanjay Gupta Cardiologist.com. www.drsanjayguptacardiologist.com. Wonderful. Cool. We see each other in a bit again for the interview. And thank you for, for being here for answering all the questions. Thank you, everybody who attended. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the D.A.R.E. podcast. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is helping people all around the world to overcome anxiety and panic attacks. You can download the app for free at DareResponse.com.